East Tennessee is a really special part of Appalachia. We're a little bit off the beaten track, but it's much more interesting and diverse and, and connected than, than people give us credit for. At the Knoxville Museum of Art, our primary focus is on artists that are connected to this really spectacularly beautiful part of the world. Some of the earliest professional artists in East Tennessee, rather than trying to focus on subject matter from far and wide, they were looking in their own backyard for inspiration. They turned to East Tennessee's lush landscape. They looked at its burgeoning urban landscape. Even contemporary artists based many of their compositions on local subjects. The museum is one of the great destinations for the arts and culture in Knoxville. But if you look back eight years ago, the Great Hall was kind of a hopeless space. It was so big and ungainly, a great place for events, but there was no art there. I knew to have a successful impact on the space, it could not be something alight and, and uh, of whimsy. Uh, it, it had to have more solid mass to it. It, to me, it was just a daunting task. When I walked into the Great Hall, I said, Richard, are you sure you want to take this on? I mean, this is like a lot. And he was like, oh, it's going to be incredible. Richard, who's a great artist who happens to live in Knoxville and works mostly in glass. Every human being is inherently fascinated with glass. It just looks like magic. It's heavy and if you touch it, it will burn you. Good, good. Ready to blow, blow. There's so much drama to the making of glass blow. and the kind of choreography of all the different players that it takes to make a piece. Up, good, good, steady. You're good, just stay with me, everything's good. Good, good. Today we're making a head. Uh, it's a sleeping head, so it's a head on its side. The finished piece will be with a, with a bird on top. Whenever you're ready. It's part of the Suspended in Dreams series that I've done. Good, good, good. Richard has such tenacity. Once he gets into the hot shop to make the things, he's probably already made it in his head several times. He has a clear vision of what he wants to do and he makes his own glass. That's very rare. Richard is the only American artist that I know that does that. He's a real chemist. He makes his own colors, all of his own blues, all of his own greens, every color that you see in his work. The knowledge is endless. I'm like, can I just like, can we put our heads together and can I suck it all in? But I don't think it's possible. I think when you're young, you're always worried about finding your voice. But as an artist at my age, it is like you breathe in, you breathe out. There are narratives with my work, but I don't feel that you have to know the narrative to understand it. I don't think that it takes much explanation. Functioning as an artist, you're sort of always in a dream state. Although you're very focused and realistic, there's also this dreamlike quality that you have to have to do these things. I think that Richard's interest in working with different materials, fire, chemicals, it's deeply rooted in having grown up in the atomic city of Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge, Tennessee was built from scratch during World War II, part of the Manhattan Project. It was a very secretive location because of the governmental research they were doing. My father was a scientist. My mother was an educator. Growing up in Oak Ridge, everyone was supposed to become a professional, whether it's a doctor or an engineer. Somehow I missed the uh, memo and uh, decided once I got into college that I wanted to be an artist. Hey, 
Richard. Hey, Tommy and I met in 1980. Coming to make sure you're working. Yeah. So I grew up in Mobile, Alabama, and the difference between Oak Ridge and Mobile are like night and day. I can't imagine them having drive through daiquiri machines in Oak Ridge. <laughs> try to get the sky part laid out. For she is so different than what I am. I mean, she's very vivacious, intelligent. I think it's a trumpet flower. I don't He's very stoic compared to me. Plays his cards pretty close to his chest. But look at this color. Yeah, it's fabulous. I mean, look, it's almost pink underneath. Yeah, this yellow is really nice. I know. Beauty can be found in so many things. For me, it happens to be found in the garden. And my work is very botanical based. It really is an extension of my joy of the natural world. Richard was thinking about the space and what would the subject of this installation be. Stephen and Bailey were benefactors and patrons that gave me carte blanche to do what I wanted. Richard began using line drawing that's usually where his initial ideas first take hold. As I started out, I wanted to have a sense of place, and then I realized that I was talking about a cycle of life. He had his team basically trace his puddle-like line drawings and superimpose those onto sheets of metal that were then cut out, keeping the drawing's expressive quality alive in the final sculpture. There is a combination of these sort of steel drawings filled in with glass, as well as freeform, blown or hot work glass. The piece was seven tons, one of the largest sculptural projects I think that's ever been done in glass. So we had all these physical issues of weight and fragility that we had to solve. And these fragments were assembled and brought to the museum, but it involved trucks that uh, were trying to make it under bridges, uh, having to be craned over the museum's walls and then wheeled into our space. I worked on the project for five years, and today, the cycle of life within the power of dreams and the wonder of infinity is a permanent installation at the Knoxville Museum of Art. It was an incredibly ambitious and kind of implausibly uh, ambitious idea to take on, and, and he pulled it off. Cycle of Life unfolds from the first section, this primordial forest, glass tree trunks based on the tulip poplar tree from East Tennessee. Number two is emergence, so it's a young couple as they emerge from the forest or emerge into life. Next, you see birds descend up into the heavens in a section that's called flight. Flight is sort of the growth from adolescence to the next step of life. The fourth element is desire, so it's a, a couple getting ready to embrace. Number five is tree of life. It's very symbolic in very many cultures about just sort of the progression of life. The final section is contemplation, and it's a monumental human head in two planes that have been disjointed. And I think signaling the end of life when that human shell breaks down and the spirit is released. The most difficult thing about the project is that there is a 22-foot gap in between one wall and the second wall, so it's like stuttering. I had to figure out how to link uh, youth and maturity together. And so that ended up being the solution of Sky. Sky is suspended from the museum's ceiling. And it's as if the spirit moves back into this elemental state that then leads around to the beginning again at the forest. The Knoxville Museum of Art was one of the first places that I came to when I was still learning about Knoxville before I had even been offered the job of music director. And I really felt completely drawn in to this metaphysical world that Richard Jolly created. 
There's this tradition of music being inspired by art. I mean, the most well-known being Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition. And I sat there thinking, this is begging to be turned into a piece of music. We came up with this idea of, what if the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra and the museum collaborate to commission a new piece of music for our audiences and our city? Michael Schechter was the composer. I knew that we could trust with it. When you walk into the door, you can't help but be aware of Cycle of Life, but... Aram had me come down to Knoxville to see the piece of art. It's literally larger than life. It's just the way you have to look up at it, that it sort of fills the space and commands attention in a way that was really striking and was very inspiring for my earliest ideas of what the piece would be. You know, one thing that struck me is that yeah. the contemplation figure is in two planes. There's a split right down the center hemisphere oh, of the head. Interesting. Yeah, I was thinking about the different parts of my own brain and writing this, and mm. that I felt a lot of internal tug of war, much as this figure might have. Aram and I started talking about the piece as a concerto, as something having the single soloist and the orchestra. I feel like Richard has the concept of cycle of life apportioned out over seven different movements. So I decided I wanted to use that seven movement structure as a way of thinking about my own work. The third movement is called flight. This is the sort of point of adolescence. It explodes in a kind of flurry of freedom and robustness. There's music that I associate with these sculptures now. I just think it's incredible the different you know, parts of my soul it sort of awakens when, when I look at it. The sixth movement is called Contemplation, and I did set this as a solo cadenza. It's darker, it's one of the most dissonant movements of the concerto, and it also is the one that's most self-reflective as well, that in this moment of contemplation, the soloist is thinking back about their life. It truly is inspiring. There is sort of a combining of the plastic and performing arts to have a little bit more of a holistic view of art. You know, I got goosebumps. It really sounded like the art looks. Now I can just get to look forward to when this piece premieres with the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra and add one more layer of energy to the cycle of life. <laughs>